This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is former Redbirds President and General Manager and Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Allie Prescott. The Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame will add another distinguished group of former players, coaches and contributors on Saturday with the induction of the class of 2014 in Nashville. Among the greats will be honored include former Titan star running back Eddie George, a past guest on Sports Files, ex-Major League pitcher Claude Osteen, and former NBA big man Popeye Jones. Also among the class is a man whose name is synonymous with local sports, specifically baseball here in the city of Memphis, Allie Prescott. The former star baseball player at then Memphis State has put together a fabulous career in law, business, and sports. Allie not only played the game of baseball, he also officiated the game of basketball serving many years at lower levels before becoming a distinguished official in the SEC. And if we leave it right there, their credentials would be strong enough to merit his enshrinement into the hall. But Ali wasn't done, not by a long shot. After serving as VP and general manager for the AA Memphis Chicks in the early 80s, Ali would return from other ventures to help with the birth of the Memphis Redbirds and the creation of magnificent AutoZone Park in the late 90s. No, it isn't Major League Baseball, but as we all know, it's not far off. And Ali served as president and general manager of the organization. Today, we'll stroll down memory lane with one of the most influential figures in Memphis sports history, Ali Prescott, next on Sports Files. Allie, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Greg. Thanks for asking me. Congratulations on the honor on Saturday. You go into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame. Give me your thoughts on that and, and when they first contacted you to tell you you were going to be part of this class. Well, it was an uh, overwhelming uh, surprise and, uh, and just one of the most humbling things that's ever happened to me in my life, Greg. I know uh, the names of lots of people who have gotten in, and I know members of this class of inductees are coming in along with me. And... Uh, you know, I, I'm just very grateful and very humbled by this award. I would imagine you, your family, your friends, your peers, very excited for you. Everybody's been very excited. I'm still blessed to have my 94-year-old mother alive, my wife and two children, and the whole family and friends. Yeah, like you say, they're just all very supportive and very, very happy. Who notified you from the hall? Rita Sparks is the incoming uh, president of the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, and she came by the office one day and Closed the door and said, I got something to tell you, and boy, <laughs> she blew me away. And we all know Rita, so I guarantee she had a big old smile on her <laughs> she face. She had that very big excited. Rita Spark smile. That's exactly right. Not your first Hall of Fame, University of Memphis Athletic Hall of Fame, the Memphis Park Commission Hall of Fame for the game of baseball, a game you, you love so, so much. What was it like to play at then Memphis State? It was great. Uh, Al Brown was my coach. Uh, he was a, a real father figure, although I had a, a wonderful father at that time. My dad was alive. But Al was great. He was a great baseball man, uh, and I just loved playing baseball with him. And then when I finished my career, uh, moving into law school, uh, he honored me by asking me to stay on as his graduate assistant. So I was actually out in, there in a baseball uniform for seven years out there. Came around in full circle, Came right? full circle, yeah. I paid my way through law school by uh, being his graduate assistant, which was Right. What was it like in high school as a player? Did you envision yourself playing collegiately? Well, I'll be honest with you, since I was old enough to throw a baseball, I've envisioned myself as playing professionally. Okay. But, you know, I just never was quite good enough. But so when I was at Kingsbury High School, I had a great coach there, Richard Brock, who was terrific. And then Coach Brown was recruiting me. So, uh, you know, toward my senior year, 
uh, I, I was very much interested in becoming a Tiger, and I was glad that I did. Was there any thought after you, you graduated that you would try your hand in, in pro ball or, or see where it lands you? Well, you know, actually, uh, my wife won't mind me saying that uh, at that time, it was before I met my wife, I was dating a young lady named Kathy Sisler, whose father was a coach for the Cardinals, and he got me a tryout. I had that? been drafted out at a high school by the Orioles, but didn't sign, had already signed the scholarship. So after law school, I, you know, I couldn't get baseball out of my system. I can't to this day. Uh, so Mr. Sisler said, come up. We had a workout one day at Bush Stadium, and you know, it, it, I, I did well, but he just said, you know, just don't know if you, you're going to pitch in the major leagues with that kind of stuff. So I just kind of put it behind me and uh, and went on. I'm going to ask you a question. I think I, pro I probably know the answer to it, but if you had to do it over again, would you have accepted the offer out of high school and not gone to college? You know, Greg, I've been asked that a number of times. I, I can't answer it. I mean, things would have all been different, you know, and I, I, maybe Barbara would have never entered my life and maybe not these children. You know, I, if I, you know, I wish that I had taken the chance to play professional baseball. I can't lie. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it would have been fun, but it might have uh, changed the dynamic of my sure. whole life. You know, I just, so I don't have any regrets. No regrets. What's your, what's your greatest memory of playing ball at Memphis State? Uh, well, I had great teammates. In addition to a great coach, we had great teammates. Dave Luce, who became a dear friend. He right. was our shortstop at that time, in addition to playing basketball. And Roy Myers and a couple of twins uh, from Nashville, Ray and Roy Carter and Mike Platt and Jerry Horvitz. These are the guys that were in my class. And, and we just developed a friendship that has lasted our entire lives. We had some great basketball, uh, baseball teams. We were playing in the Missouri Valley Conference at mm -hmm. time. Bradley was very good. St. Louis University was very good. Cincinnati was very good. Uh, I guess if I'm thinking of a memory, uh, when we played Cincinnati one time, we all got to go out and see the Giants play, and Willie McCovey hit the hardest ball I've ever seen hit in my life. <laughs> you had a few of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He did. You graduate Memphis State. You go on to law school at Memphis. You graduate uh, law school, and you become an attorney. And this is in the, in the early 70s. Correct. But there's also the love for sport, and you get into officiating. Right. And, and you're telling me your father was also an official. He was, yeah. So you followed the path of your dad while still trying to juggle being an attorney, your, your main job. What was that like? Well, it was fun. Uh, you know, I, I started refereeing at my dad's uh, encouragement uh, in, you know, junior high, then high school, then small college, uh, junior college and small college. And then uh, in 1978, Bob Weltlick was the coach at Ole Miss at that time. And he uh, observed me working a game uh, against uh, Shelby State. It was called Shelby State at that time. And he was uh, scouting one of their players. And he recommended me to the Southeastern Conference. C.M. Newton was actually the supervisor of officials. How about for that, that? One year between his terms at Alabama and Vanderbilt. And, and so I, you know, I was thrilled to be asked to become part of the staff of the SEC. And I did that for 17 years in Division One. Is officiating officiating, whatever the level is, or is it like playing any sport where you have to get better to play college ball. You have to be really good to play pro. Did you have to pick up your game to officiate in the SEC? Oh, there's no question about it. You know, I mean, that was uh, the, all, all the values doubled, tripled, quadrupled, whatever. Then, you know, the, the coaches' uh, careers are on the line. Uh, fans are there paying lots of money to see these games. They're very exciting. I often tell people that I played, uh, you know, we played in the Amateur World Series a couple of times. But there was nothing like refereeing a hugely important Division I college basketball game. I remember I had the first game when Louisville and Kentucky renewed their rivalry wow. in Rupp Arena. And, and you know, I had, had just had the joy of refereeing a lot of games like that. It was very exciting to be part of it. But you certainly had to raise your game. You officiated in five NCAA tournaments. What was that like? It was a thrill. It was a thrill. I, uh, you know, uh, I would have loved to have made it to the Final Four, but the better referees made it to the Final Four. I never did have that uh, opportunity, but uh, the five NCAA tournament games that I refereed, I I'll never forget them. I mean, they were great. All right, let's, let's look back at that time. There had to have been a coach that got under your crawl. <laughs> Give me, give me a name or two, Allie. I think enough time has passed. No, that's okay. I don't think that'd be me. You know, interestingly, Greg, I've got some pictures of Wimp Sanderson and, and me going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, <laughs> and I loved Wimp. He was great because he's the kind of guy that would yell at a play and then go right back to coaching. But I've got to say, and I hope he's not watching tonight, uh, Pat Kennedy used to drive me crazy. You know, <laughs> when he was, dry, he was uh, coaching at Florida State at that time, and I was also in the Metro in addition to the SEC. And, uh, 
Yeah, Pat was one of those kind of guys. That he just thought if he yelled at you the whole game, he'd get all the important calls. Right. You know, he it tried to intimidate. It didn't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> but he just he became an annoyance. You know. <laughs> but he's a fine coach. Is there something that one of the coaches in the past said to you? And remember, it is a family show. Right. That that still you still remember today? Like what was that? What? Uh, Yes, there's there's one thing that comes immediately to mind. I refereed the uh, Louisville Indiana game one time in the Hoosier Dome, uh, and Bobby Knight was still coaching Indiana, and I had an out of bounds play right in front of him, and he was standing because the elevated floor. He was standing right be behind me, and he said, "I'm very surprised you saw that. I'm very proud of you for seeing that." And I said, well, thanks, Coach. That's what they're paying me for today. And he said, well, don't blank up the rest of the game because I gave you a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking to hear from Bobby right. Knight. So you have this terrific career as an official. You're an attorney. And, and now, again, we go back to your, 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 I would call it your greatest love, baseball as far as sports are concerned. There's no question. Okay. And, and now the Memphis Chicks and, and Avron Fogelman, they come a-calling. Tell me that. Well, I was, uh, you know, I had... Uh, made my decision. I'm a lawyer. I mean, I've been practicing law every day, except when I'm out of town refereeing a basketball game since 1972. It's now 1979. My wife, Barbara, and I are engaged to be married in September of 79. We were married September 21st. And Avron calls me one time and he said, I've just fired my general manager. Would you, everybody tells me that you love baseball. Would you like to talk to me? And I said, of course. You know, I'm Baseball. It was part of my of my heart and soul. So we talked, and uh, he persuaded me that I could do the job, and and you know my career just deviated from the law right into professional baseball. And what a thrill! You know, I never was quite good enough to play the game professionally, but uh, to have a chance to to be the general manager of the Montreal Expos Double A team in my hometown. That seemed like a dream come true to me, and it was. Yeah, to be around it pretty much 24/7, and I would imagine I, I've heard this is way before I came to Memphis. But those Expos teams, they produced a lot of really good players that came through Memphis. Oh, absolutely. Tim Raines, Tim Wallach, Dave Hostetler, and then all those incredible pitchers, uh, none better than Memphis own Charlie Lee. Sure. Uh, a blessed memory, as people would say. We sure miss Charlie. And, and but King, Kingsbury High, too, right? That's exactly yes. right, ironically. We went to the same high school, and then he pitched at Memphis, you know, for a while, too. So, uh, yeah, but we had uh, Dave Palmer, Scott Sanderson, Bill Gullickson, uh, Brent Smith. I mean, wow. there were some really, really outstanding young pitchers. Uh, all the Expos pitchers except Steve Rogers came through Memphis. Yeah, the Expos were a franchise. I always wondered why they weren't better because they had all this talent. But uh, they certainly produced a lot of really good players. What was the hardest thing about that for well, you? Well, I had never managed people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and as – my life unfolds when I had the joy of uh, and the privilege of running the Redbirds. I had a huge staff. I didn't have a very large staff with the Memphis Chicks in the early 80s, but still just uh, motivating, leading people. I mean, that was something I would not be, you know, it's just, it doesn't come natural. No, you have to kind of learn that, I think. Exactly. You know? learn, learn on the fly. Yeah, exactly right. So you finish up your, your tenure with the Chicks, and now you go back and do some other things. So with MIFA, with tell me well, the I things. went back and practiced law for two years. Okay, I, you know, I because a couple of law firms had talked to me about you're always welcome to come back. You know, my partners when I left in '79 said you're always welcome, and I really had a an interest in developing a a sports agency practice, and so I actually re-entered the practice of law after uh, retiring after the 82 season in the fall of 82 and uh, pretty quickly signed up some really good minor league players. Andres Galarraga, Yvonne Calderon, Mark wow. Langston. But you know, they don't make any money in the minor leagues, Greg. And the agent doesn't make any money in them <laughs> these guys, in. Until, they make to, <laughs> until they make it to the big leagues. Right. And I was just very impatient. And then the, the opportunity came along to be uh, the director of the Memphis Park Commission. And, uh, you know, I, I have tremendous respect for the practice of law, but I just didn't feel like I was contributing like a partner should. Uh, and so I accepted the offer and, you know, I grew up on the Memphis Parks and uh, to have a chance to be the director, that was a thrill. Did that for four years and then for a brief uh, time, I worked in commercial real estate with Scott Ledbetter and then I was a director of MIFA for uh, almost eight years before the Redbirds came along. But it, yes, it, it doesn't end there. <laughs> Here come the Redbirds, and, and of course, that's when I first met you and, and learned more about you was the Redbirds. How did that happen? Well, uh, Dean Jernigan had been executive vice president of Fogelman Properties back in 1979, uh, and uh, 
And so Dean, of course, Dean played at Messick. I played at Kingsbury. We both loved baseball. He knew uh, that I was probably still, you know, wondering, you know, about some kind of life in baseball. Right. And Major League Baseball was expanding. And Dean called me one day and said, I really think I've got a chance to get one of these two expansion franchises for Memphis. Uh, he said, but I'm not going to do it unless you'll do it with me. And so I've been director of MIFA for eight years. I thought that's where I was going to retire. Got a wife and two children. And uh Barbara says, well, here we go again. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I, I can't say One no. One more to, time. I can't say no to this. And, you know, and so I, I certainly don't regret saying yes. I mean, the thought of being involved with uh, rolling out the Memphis Redbirds and having, you know, helping build AutoZone Park, uh, I think it's just, it was a great time in life. Kids, if there's a lesson learned today, connections. It's all about, <laughs> it's all about connections. Yeah, you have to be awfully proud. Here we are now in 2014. They've been around a long time. New deal just completed between the Cardinals and the city of Memphis. The city of Memphis owns AutoZone Park. The Cardinals own the Redbirds. I want to ask your opinion about the deal. But okay. when you look back at really what you started, uh, you, you and Dean and, and, and some folks that were behind Rita Sparks and, of course, the Sparks family, you feel like a proud papa? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Greg. When I was on the stump, you know, making speeches as the president and general manager of the Redbirds, I would tell people, not, you know, it was the truth. I looked in the mirror one day and I saw the only employee of Memphis Redbirds baseball. I mean, I had the privilege of building that staff from the ground up. You know, Dean gave me the, the complete uh, autonomy to do that. And so to put that staff together that worked so incredibly hard to roll out Redbird AAA baseball in Memphis and, uh, and, you know, and then to be part of watching the, the development of AutoZone Park and, and what used to be at the corner of 3rd and Union, and now we have the, 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 by far the finest ballpark in all of minor league baseball. Yeah, I, I, it was a very proud time. It's, it's a gem. There's no question. It's the gem of AAA baseball, all minor league baseball, and, of course, for Memphis right there, it's a centerpiece. But what do you think now about the deal that was made between the city and the Cardinals? I think it's fantastic. You know, I admire uh, the people who have run the foundation for all these many years. It was the only not-for-profit running a professional baseball program right. uh, team. Uh, but it was time. Uh, and, you know, the Cardinals bring credibility, they bring deep pockets, and they bring a love for the city of Memphis here, you know. So we know that uh, we've got that 17-year lease. I mean, the Cardinals are going to be here. I don't think any of the taxpayers of the city of Memphis should worry for one second the, that uh, that this deal is not going to work financially. I I applaud the city council and Mayor Horton for doing this because I think it's going to be great for our city. And as a baseball lover, we get Cardinals uh, best farm hands. You know, it, it, you go to AutoZone Park this year, you were seeing some great young talent. With your schedule, how often do you get over to see a game? Well, not as often as I'd like. Uh, you know, we live pretty far from the ballpark. I, you know, I probably make one, try to make two games per homestand, something like that. I'd like to say more, but you know, for for five years I missed zero games. So, you exactly. Know, Barbara you've says, your we've been there, done that. I'm going to all the games. Yeah, <laughs> you, you've had your full games, no doubt. Can you, when, when you look back at how the city of Memphis and, and sports have grown, and now you see AutoZone Park, FedEx Forum, and NBA team, does it blow your mind? It just makes me, again, very proud as a lifelong Memphian. And I remember, again, when I was on the stump uh, as the president uh, and the general manager of the Redbirds, I told people, uh, AAA baseball affiliated with the St. Louis Cardinals in the finest ballpark ever built below the major league level, that's as close as we're ever going to get to the major league. Right. I just didn't, after all the key people in this town who couldn't bring NFL football here, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't know other key uh, people uh, we're working even at that moment in time to to get the the NBA here, and I'm just thrilled to have the Grizzlies here. I mean, you know, I'm a proud Tiger, but uh, I think the Grizzlies have just an enormous addition to our city, and they're great. It says an awful lot about the people of this town, the resiliency, the blue collar attitude, the never give up attitude. And I, I think that's that's what we all have, and I consider myself a part of it being here now almost 20 years. Yeah. Ali, before we uh, wrap things up, we do this with each one of our guests. We do something called Five for the Road. Okay. I want a quick answer to okay. these five questions. What is your favorite professional sports team? St. Louis Cardinals. I thought I, I, thought <laughs> I would get that answer. That was a no-brainer. Yes. How about your favorite pro athlete of all time? Stan Musial. Stan the man. Yep, I, he was my childhood idol. After that, as I became a pitcher, it, it became Bob Gibson. But as a child... 
you know, your childhood memories latch on to you. And I, I just love the man. And when I heard Bob Costas do the eulogy, I didn't even realize what an incredibly wonderful man the was. Absolutely. What's your favorite music? What do you like to listen to? Uh, I'm a closet case rock and roll guy. Get I mean, out. You know, I might. Uh, I'm, I love Cat Stevens. I love Sticks. I love Metallica. I, you know, I, I like rock and roll. Sticks will be coming to the garden, I think. This Barbara summer. and I will be there. Going to <laughs> Absolutely, we will. <laughs> um, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, The Natural. You know, I could watch it every day. The Natural and Hoosiers, I think, are my two favorite movies. I mean, you know, I like movies with, uh, with, uh, you know, deep meaning. Right. But, but you asked me my favorite movie, you knew it would be about baseball, right? And I think that is a phenomenal movie. I think The, the Natural, and, and Hoosiers is great, too. The Natural and Robert Redford is terrific. How about if it was a non-sports movie? Is there something that jumps out at you? Uh, maybe A Few Good Men. Sure. Uh, Jack Nicholson. Uh, I, I just love that show. Good Will Hunting. I mean, I saw I, that I a couple of weeks ago again. Yeah, yeah. Great movies. Favorite television show? Favorite television show. Gosh. I'm thrilled that Jack Bauer's back. <laughs> I'm a, 20, so you're, you're I'm a 24, 24 fan, absolutely. It was absolutely. funny, on my radio show, yes, a uh, couple days ago it was, uh, Eli had asked me, Eli Savoy, my partner, if I'm a 24 guy, I said no, and he said he wasn't either. I've never seen one of the shows, but I've heard only great things. I'm going to have to go back years from now and, and, and start to look back at the episodes. Well, you know, Barbara and I, again, Greg, were not hooked on it, and our son uh, survived a very serious accident on uh, Christmas Eve many years ago and you know like kids do he had the box set of the first couple of years of 24 and so we sat down and watched and watched and, and we'd, we'd stay up to three in the morning <laughs> just watching you know we couldn't go to bed Allie thank you so much oh Greg and, and it's again, been a real pleasure congratulations have a great time tomorrow night I know there's the dinner and then Saturday with the ceremony yeah we're very much looking forward to it Allie thanks Prescott, for asking sure me. we'll take a quick break when we come back it's overtime Those of us who work in the media in Memphis and the Mid-South, and specifically in the sports world, have had the distinct pleasure of being able to cover some of the most distinguished and accomplished prep coaches in the history of Tennessee athletics. And some of these coaches continue to hone their craft. A few weeks ago, CVHS baseball coach Buster Kelso became the all-time winningest coach in Tennessee baseball history as the Purple Wave knocked off Briarcrest Christian 4-1 to give Buster the 934th win of his storied career. Of course, the humble coach deflects the praise he gets and directs it towards all the great players and assistant coaches he's had over the years. But the fact is, Buster's teams have won eight state championships, including one last year. Now, tomorrow, the 31-5 Purple Wave are on the road at Father Ryan for a doubleheader in their best-of-three state quarterfinal round matchup. Buster's win total is now at 937, and hopefully for his sake and the sake of the brothers, it's 937 and counting. Now, after his monumental victory, we spoke to Buster about the accomplishment and asked him if being the all-time winningest coach was something he set out to accomplish. I uh, started coaching 1974, didn't start doing baseball until 1979, and uh, it just kind of happened. Been with it for 33 years, and um, had a bunch of good kids to work with, so it's been real easy. These guys are pretty special. Every year's got a different quality, different characteristic. These guys are pretty special. They like to have fun, they're loose, uh, they're talented, they know they're talented, they're confident, but they're not cocky, they're not arrogant. It's a good bunch to be around. It's hard to make it. We got one right now playing for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, or De Rays, a Logan Forsyth. Uh, we've got a couple of them, bunch in the minor leagues. We've had some in the past that have made it. It's, it's, it's a tough gig to make it in the major leagues. Some of these kids might make it. They're good enough. I project for them to play every game as hard as they played all year long and have a chance to win every game. And it's very rare that we line up play where we don't think we're going to win. And that's not being cocky, that's just being confident. And they've got a chance to win every game if they play hard. And they play extremely hard. You know, this particular bunch is, um, unique and they're so close and the seniors are close to the juniors and the, we've only got one sophomore but they're even close with the JV guys. It's a, it's a real good bunch to work with. So when you got a lot of good spirited people on the bench and in practices, it makes it real easy. The job's not very hard.
It's a blast. I mean, being with him for four years is just unforgettable. I mean, it's like a great experience. Uh, he gives us what we need to do. He gives us everything we need to know in order to uh, play to the best of our abilities, and it's just fun to do. Fun to be around him. He's a great coach. He can be tough when we act yeah. up or when we do things we're not supposed to, but he puts us in line when we need to be. It's fun all the time. Once again, congrats to Buster and best of luck to the brothers and all the local teams in the tri-state area vying for high school state championships. In addition, congrats to Lonnie Ballantyne, the former Memphis Tiger, and Ole Miss product Dante Moncrief, who were both taken in the recent NFL draft. Dante went in round three to the Colts, and Lonnie was chosen by the Texans with the last pick in the draft. And that'll do it for now. Next week, I visit with Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Famer Bill Walton. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.